um, yesterday morning's chapel, we talked about our brokenness, um, that by your very nature you stand condemned. And the eyes of God are seen about you on the inside and the out. is completely offensive. There's nothing good about you. Um, but the scriptures confirm that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So on our own, we are helpless, hopeless, and dead. Um, we must be born again, literally, because everything we have, everything we came into this world with is corrupt. And then we talk about God's remedy. Um, you know, what could possibly undo who we are and what we have done? And the answer is Christ. The Son of God was born in our flesh, but without our, our nature, making him the first and the only hope of all mankind. So in his death, the innocent blood of Jesus Christ was the only thing worthy enough, this was my illustration of him, the only thing that was worthy enough or pure enough to actually absorb the sinfulness of man and pay for our redemption. This led us to just ponder the, the costliness of, of that transaction, of what Christ had to actually do for us, that the perfect Son of God had to take upon himself our brokenness and death. And the agony of God's wrath was against the treason of our hearts as if it was his. So literally, he's taken our stake. Um, and this reminds me of the passage where it says that uh, God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us so that we might become the righteousness God, if we never understand, Jesus Christ has never come into contact with sin. It was a very, it was a very dirty job, and your redemption was very expensive. And then yesterday afternoon, we talked about our purpose and God's glory, how we have nothing of value to offer to our Creator except worship. That's the only thing we can do is respond. And how God created us in his very own image and likeness so that in a relationship of knowing him, we might respond to him according to the honor and the glory that he is worthy of receiving from us. And I make the statement that it probably would have been God to have simply never created us. That would have been the easiest way to say it. But he didn't do that. He made us knowing what was going to happen and having a plan in place. Because he considered the price of our redemption for some reason. He considered the price of our redemption to be worth it. He brought it on himself. He knew it. You know, what's the plan from the very foundation of this just led us to really just to really just make the observation that our redemption is not about us. We like to think about our needs, our desperate problems, and God's love is going to come down and fix all this stuff for us. But that's really not the full picture. The full picture is that your redemption is not the glory of God for you. You can. 2 Corinthians 5, 15, we read, and he died for all so that they who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and was raised again. So we see in God's redemption what he's trying to accomplish as a purpose. It's something he's trying to use us for. And what he's trying to use us for is his glory, and that's why he is redeeming us. And I want to add to this, um, this is Titus. 14 says uh, talking about Christ actually 
while we wait for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, and this says this, who gave himself for us um, to redeem us from all the wickedness and to purify us for himself. For himself. Look at that. He's doing this for himself. That we would be his very own people, eager to do what is good. So, God is doing this to purify us, to prepare us, um, to do good works, to honor and glorify Him. So, God has purchased you to see the effects of His redemption played out in your life. You see the effects of God's redemption being played out in your life. in a way that you would say, yeah, that's definitely the power of God. Because that is what your redemption is supposed to be accomplishing, is you miss out on the aftermath of redemption. Because we are not seeing the effects of God's redemption being played out in our lives like it should. Something's not right. And so really, all that is left for you and I is to draw near to the one who has given you every reason to find satisfaction in him. He, he's provided everything. Our redemption, our life, he wants us to be fully satisfied in him. In order to be satisfied in him, you have to draw near to him. Just as Jesus um, said when he made the statement, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And those three things, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus is saying, hey, I am the remedy to everything. Can you imagine any other man making that kind of a statement? I am the way. If I got up and told you, I know the way, I'm the way. You might believe me for a little bit. What if I said, I am the truth. Not I have truth, I am truth. I'm the source of truth. Well, then you might start to really wonder if I'm a little crazy. What if I then said, I am the life? Well, probably in about 40 years, you're going to read my obituary while we're here. And that's not going to last very long. But the man who made this claim, I think one of the only men in history to make this claim, is actually a man who rose from the dead. You cannot go and find the grave site of Jesus, even though he's one of the most famous men in world history, you can't find him. You can go and stand over Charles Darwin's grave site. You could probably dig up and find his bones if you really wanted to, but Jesus Christ, his bones were never in his risen. So this brings us um, this morning, and uh, particularly the, the, the actual aftermath of redemption. So like I said, being played out in your life. And if you don't see that happening in your life, <coughs> what is that? And where do, you, where do you begin to start to see that? The word aftermath is kind of usually has some destructive connotations. Um, most commonly, I think, with um, war. Um, do the names... Um, Hiroshima and Nagasaki mean anything to anyone here? Uh, those are the two cities in Japan um, that were bombed in the first use of nuclear uh, or nuclear weapon um, during World War II. And uh, these were cities of hundreds of thousands of people, hundreds of thousands of people. Any of you from Milwaukee? Yeah, so it's Milwaukee. Minnesota, probably Minneapolis. Um, big cities. And you know, the, the drop of bomb or whatever, you know, not very big, but this nuclear bomb leveled the whole city. Have you ever seen a picture of the aftermath? Everything was flat. Everything. Everyone was wiped out. Every life. Every animal, every Bird. Can you imagine being in your house? I mean, as soon as the bomb went off, you know, three miles away, level. The aftermath of 
the nuclear bomb, and yet the power that God, the power in God's redemption is far greater, and many of us don't see the aftermath. Something's not right. There's something we don't understand. So, the power of redemption that God wants to bring into the daily life of those who have redeemed what is that power? And I have to write these notes on my own. Read them off my computer. Um, while I was thinking about this, I wrote down actually ten, ten things um, that show the power of redemption in your life, daily life. Okay, if you're a Christian today, ten things that should blow your world away if you're a Christian. And I just had to stop because 10, we can't even talk about 10. In fact, after I wrote these down, I realized we can't really talk about any of them in depth. Um, but I'm gonna mention them to you. And what I really wanna do is, if, if you are serious about seeing the aftermath of redemption in your own life, come to me and, and I will send you these 10 things not an email, so it's big email. Um, but I will send you these things, and I want you to look at the scripture verses that I pull up from them. Explain in very clear language uh, what each of these what each of these things mean. Um, and now read these to me. Um, number one, not necessarily in any order of importance. Uh, number one, um, God's redemption um, provides us with a true motivation.
going forth. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. So that's how you look to God. Holy and blameless. It says, in love he predestined us to be adopted as his sons through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will. Um, as, you're, as I'm reading this Ephesians, think about two things. Think about what God has done for you and why. Because both of those things are stated repeatedly in here. So, um, he predestined us to be adopted as his sons through Jesus Christ. Why? In accordance with, the ple- with his pleasure and will to the praise of his glorious grace, which he freely given us in the one he loves. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us. In other words, just poured out generously with all wisdom and understanding. And he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his great pleasure which he purposed in Christ to be put into effect when the times will have reached their fulfillment to bring all things in heaven and earth together under one head, even Christ. In him we we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will, in order that we, who are the first to hope in Christ, why? Might be for the praise of his glory. It's all about the praise and glory of God. But you get to come along with for the ride. And you were also included in Christ. When you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit, guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession. Why? glory. It's not about us. For this reason, ever since I heard about your faith, that's Paul speaking, in the Lord Jesus, and your love for all the saints, I have not stopped giving thanks for you and remembering you in my prayers. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I also pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. And I stop there because that is his point right here. You are valuable to the one who is most valuable. God considers you his glorious inheritance. Why? Because he's redeemed you. And in your redeemed condition, for God, that you are a wonderful thing to him. But only because he's redeemed you. So you're valuable. Number five, freedom from burden, guilt, and the obligation of sin. Have you ever had to deal with any kind of guilt? Any kind of shame? Any kind of burden that has to do with looking at who you are and being disappointed in yourself or what you've done, or maybe your inability to control yourself when you have committed yourself, no, I will no longer do this, and then it happens again. God's redemption blows the doors off that problem. He says all the guilt and the burden and the obligation of sin is gone. when you do something wrong, that sin has been paid for you. And you don't have to stop and deal with it. It's already been dealt with. It's already been found. You get to do what? You get to stand up from that, no matter what it is, and you get right back to the business of honoring God with your life, not worrying about who you are because your identity in God's sight is pure and redeemed. Six, an unselfish and fully satisfying purpose. 
You don't get that any other way unless you've been redeemed. An unselfish and fully satisfying purpose. There's a lot of things that sort of satisfy, but there's only one thing that unselfishly satisfies, and that is worshiping your Redeemer. Number seven, comfort and strength to face all pain and suffering. This is a big one. Because there's going to be a, there's going to be a lot of pain and suffering in your life. I've had to deal with some pain and suffering, mental and physical. And maybe not anything close to what some other people on the group this size would have had to face, but do you know what God says about your pain and suffering? In fact, let's just look at this one. This is uh, Romans chapter 8, um, verse 18. Paul just starts right out and says, I consider that the uh, that our present sufferings are not worthy to be compared with the glory that will be revealed in us. So he's saying, um, physical pain, that thing, insignificant. How can it be bigger? Compared to the glory that's going to be revealed in us. What makes that possible? Your redemption. Because you've been redeemed. There is a glory that is coming. It says, the creation waits in eager expectation for the Son of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it. In hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the glorious freedom of the children of God. We keep talking about sin and death in the world being completely uh, thrown away at some time in the future. Um, 2 Corinthians chapter 4 Very close to another memory verse we have this summer, 416 through 18. Let's see if we can get it here. Therefore, we do not lose heart. So though outwardly we are wasting away, inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. It's hard to face now, but if you keep your eyes fixed on that eternal glory, it gives you the comfort and the strength to face the suffering and pain. Number eight, freedom from the frustrating struggle with sin. Turn to Romans chapter seven. So Paul here, even the guy who God is using to write scripture, is sharing his uh, personal struggle with sin. He says, we know that the law is spiritual, but I am unspiritual. It's 714. Um, sold as a slave to sin. I do not understand what I do, for what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, I do. Have you ever had this problem? And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. As it is written, it is no longer I myself who do, who, who do it, but it is sin living in me. So Paul's redeemed. He still has the sinful nature in him. But when he sins, it's his sinful nature. And when you sin, it's your sinful nature. And your sinful nature has been paid for. goes on. Uh, verse 18. I know that nothing good lives in me, that is, in my sinful nature. 
For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For what I do is not the good I want to do. No, the evil I do not want to do. This is keep this, this I keep on doing. It's hard to follow this. <laughs> now if I do what I do not want to do, okay. Verse 21. So I find this law at work. When I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being I delight in God's law. But I see another law at work in the members of my body, which is war against the law of my mind, and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within my members. And then he makes the statement, what wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? So he's got all these desires to sin inside of him, and he can't purge them out. He says, who will deliver me? And then he gives the answer. But thanks be to God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I myself in my mind am a slave of God's law, but in the sinful nature, a slave to the law of sin. So, through redemption, we have been free from this frustrating struggle. Because when you face the desire to sin, you can reckon that. With God, you can reckon those tendencies. Your sinful nature that has already been paid for. And with your mind, you can choose to pursue the law of God for the goodness and the righteousness of God. Because so many times, what keeps us from pursuing the righteousness of God is wallowing over here in our sin and trying to lift ourselves out of the muck. But he's, what he's saying is you don't need to clean yourself off. You know, you don't need to sit in that mud pit and, and try to get the mud off of you while there's mud all over your hands. He says you don't need to do that. You just need to walk out of the mud pit. Because you don't need to be concerned about the dirtiness of your sinful nature. It's there. It's not going away. But it's been, it's been redeemed. Like, it hasn't been redeemed in the sense that you don't have it anymore. It's been, it's been reckoned, paid for. So you don't need to have turned so much attention on not sinning. But by going after righteousness, your, your sin will, will naturally be left behind. But if you just try to fight with the sin, that's just a never-ending process because you're never going to get rid of the desire to do sin. That's going to be with you until you die. And then lastly, um, I guess I should have ten. But I have nine. Um, the resurrection of your sinful body. And by resurrection, I actually mean in this life. The wonder and the joy of freely pressing on to become more in Christ. Um, we're going to take a look at turn to Philippians chapter 3. He hasn't arrived. He hasn't become perfect. 
But he says this, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining forward to what is ahead. And what is the what is the what is the only reason that he has the right to to forget a sin in Luther's counsel? That that is not don't take that for granted. What is our ability to do that? It's paid for, it's been redeemed. He says, I press on toward the goal to win the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. He says, all of us who are mature should take the same view of things. He calls it the resurrection. If you back up to verse 10, he says, I, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings. Um, sharing in his sufferings. And he says, becoming like him in his death. So we become like Christ in his death when we recognize that the sin has been paid for. But he goes a step further. He says, and so somehow to attain to the resurrection from the dead. Because when Christ was dying, being buried, and rising again, your sinful nature and, and your sin were, were going along with him. So your sinful nature, it died with him. It was paid for. It was buried. It was set aside. But then when Christ rose again, that's also applied to you. He has given you the ability to rise above your sinful nature. Not get rid of it, but he's given you the ability to rise above it and to live in righteousness. And that's what he's calling this resurrection. So being resurrected is a daily process of rising above your sinful nature, not by fighting it. You don't win over the sinful nature by fighting it. What Paul is saying here is he's striving towards something else. He's not fighting with the sinful nature he has right here. He is striving towards the righteousness of God. And he has the privilege of striving towards that righteousness and leaving behind the mistakes and the failures that happen along the way because they've been paid for, they've been settled. And so you see this, 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 this path of victory you can blaze towards righteousness because sin doesn't weigh you down. Not because it's not happening, but because it doesn't weigh you down when it does happen. Because it's been settled, it's been taken care of. sinful body and your selfish nature will be destroyed. Death is actually the Lord God's son. God has redeemed you, given you a new life, you pay for your sinful nature, you pay for the, the deeds of that sinful nature, and the final step is for you to shed that shell, that you're, this shell that you're in right now, this sinful body, this sinful nature. And so when you die, that is your final victory. Because then God throws all of that out, and you know what he brings in? If you're still in Philippians, it's in uh, 3.20 and 21. It says, but our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly wait for a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control, that must be a lot of power, says he will transform our lowly body so that we will be like his glorious body. The body that Jesus was resurrected with after he had paid for sin, he was resurrected that glorious body that was pure again. Remember, the, the sin didn't stay in the sponge. He squeezed it out, and it came up, and it was pure, and it was sinless again. That body that he had, that glorious body, we're going to get one in his likeness. And so then, complete victory. The sinful nature paid for. The deeds of that sinful nature paid for. And then finally, the nature itself and the sin being left behind, being destroyed. And when the presence of God in full righteous, in full righteous 
wardrobe. Never to see or touch sin again. And it had nothing to do with this. God has given you his glory, and we get to play the part. Sometimes I think about this in my head when I pray. one thing to be here hearing a message and maybe not be receiving it, but there are people who are going to hurt this message. They don't even, they're not even coming into contact with, with the potential for this. But you're here. And you have one of these. This is my source text for everything I'm saying, hopefully. This is your Bible. And most of these things are stated plainly. <coughs> There's a lot of parts of the Bible that I don't understand. But the parts that I do understand happen to be also some of the most important parts. Um, just a few other things here. Your, your redemption has changed your identity. Um, Romans 5.1 says you've been justified by faith. Your new identity is justified. <laughs> your previous identity was guilty. Now you're justified. New identity. But it's not just that. Um, Romans 5.17 talks about our righteousness. Um, the righteousness of God has been credited to your account. So you went from being sinful to being righteous. Guilty to justified. Sinful to righteous. There's, there's one more I can think of, and that is you've been adopted. You have a new father, your heavenly father. Heavenly father. This is a complete change of identity to who we are. And all of this is behind the curtain of God's redemption. All of it. All of it. You're missing out. So as a result of your new identity and these truths about your redemption, um, you actually have what's called a calling. Um, this is uh, Ephesians 4.1. Paul speaking, he says, As a prisoner of the Lord, then I urge you, to live a life worthy of the calling you've received. That's your redemption. Are you living worthy of your redemption? In other words, does your life reflect the fact that you've been redeemed? Are you experiencing any of these nine things I'm talking about, these powers that redemption brings into your life? Um, Colossians 1.10 
something similar to the Colossians. It says, um, and we pray this in order that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and may please him in every way. See, God's purpose and redemption in your life now, day to day to day. And I've been using the word redemption, but we could really replace it with the word gospel. Maybe you've heard the word gospel, the good news. The gospel is the story of redemption. And um, on the brochure, it said, the, you know, we're going to talk about the importance of the gospel in your daily life. And that's what this is. How redemption actually changes the way that you live your daily life. This is not something um, to believe and then get a ticket to heaven. This is about a radical transformation of your daily life. And it all goes back to the cross. The cross is not something you look back on. I believe that. That's why I'm going to heaven. No, the cross comes with you. This is your strength. All these powers I'm talking about, the powers of redemption, comes from remembering and acknowledging what the cross has accomplished. And you have to remind yourself of that every day and every time you need these powers. Every time you're facing pain and suffering, every time you're facing um, loneliness, every time you're facing the, the fact that you don't feel valuable, every time you're facing the fact that you need forgiveness, all of these things come back to the cross. You can't leave it behind. It must come with you. We are calling, what God is calling you to, is calling you to your, you to your new identity as redeemed by Jesus Christ. So is your life being lived worthy of the redemption you receive? And over it's saying this, uh, this is a phrase I'm borrowing from somebody else. Really, really well. Um, are you practicing the full benefit of the cross in your daily life? Or are you leaving some of the benefit of the shedding of Jesus' precious blood, what he actually paid to enable you to do, are you just leaving that gift behind? Or are you taking full advantage of what his suffering is meant to accomplish? actually doing anything. It's you acknowledging God and inviting Him into His will in your life. Talking to Him. And don't stop talking to Him. Talk to Him until you see this taking root in your life. Don't stop talking to Him. Don't stop begging Him. Don't stop seeking Him. Yeah, I know it's about in you, for you, Lord, have never forsaken those who seek you. Seek the Lord. Don't seek him once and say, oh, that didn't work. Continually seek him. Seek him continuously. And he will not abandon you. It starts with prayer. 
And then I was asking a, a church in a small group of moms. I was just wondering this even to myself. If I want to love, if I want to love God more, is really your motivation. You have to love God. You can't just pretend to do these things. You have to love God. How do you do that? Especially if you don't particularly feel like loving God. And somebody made this point. Somebody asked me how this thing that I hung on to. I'm going to pass this on to you. They said, you can't love something you don't know. So, how much time do you invest in getting to know God? And of course, you know what it is that we spend this time in this word. The, the discipline. Just because God has redeemed you doesn't mean that you don't have to be diligent. Somebody tells you, you know, how good, you know, my grandma's apple pie is. And you can believe them, you know, you've had great apple pie before. But you're really not going to fall in love with your friend's um, grandma's apple pie until you taste it. No matter how much you think about how great it is or how much you acknowledge it, you're going to taste it. You have to taste God. You have to get to know him. And that will stir up a love for him. If you wait for a love for God to start seeking Him, it'll never happen. But if you diligently seek Him, that will produce a love for God as you get to know Him. You can't give up. You can't stop. But don't stop praying. But don't stop getting to know Him. And through those two things, um, you will start to see the aftermath of redemption in your own life as you grab a hold of some of these things apply to some of you more than others. Some of you really need to hear those certain things, and some of you need to hear those other things. So I hope um, your preaching has been a blessing to you, and I hope you make some kind of plan. Um, if you don't feel like you are, experience the full benefit of that process. So that next year at this time, you are a radically different living as someone who has been redeemed by God. And I'm going to pray that my life will be the same as him. We are all on a journey. We're all somewhere in between. And God's using them in my mouth right now up here. Okay? But this heart and this mind probably go through just as many struggles as some of you. We're all in the same boat. So let's just take a few minutes and uh, if you feel like you're ready to respond to God over this matter in your own heart, I just want to give you the opportunity.